Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program, which is brought to you through the support of our sponsors and our expert contributors. The PNA is dedicated to educating people with pituitary disorders, their families, and their health care providers. The PNA is a nonprofit organization that relies on the support from our members and donors. During the webinar, feel free to type in your questions at any time, but please note that all questions will be saved until the end of the webinar. We have allotted time to answer as many questions as possible. Any questions that are not answered will be reserved and answered by email. Today's webinar, Next Generation Imaging, Preoperative Planning, and Surgical Navigation Using 3D Virtual Reality Guidance for Pituitary Surgery, is being presented by Dr. Robert Lewis. Dr. Lewis is a fellowship-trained neurosurgeon and program director of the Skull Base and Pituitary Tumor Program at Hogue Neurosciences Institute. Dr. Lewis has particular expertise in endoscopic and minimally invasive treatment of benign and malignant brain tumors, cellar and paracellar tumors, and skull base tumors. Through the use of cutting-edge neuroimaging and neuronavigational equipment, he utilizes the concept of keyhole sur neurosurgery minimizing the damage to surrounding brain, vascular, and soft tissue structures. Dr. Lewis believes that most brain and skull-based tumors can be resected through small openings or by utilizing naturally occurring or orifices. This approach has been demonstrated to decrease postoperative pain, minimize neurologic complications, and shorten length of hospitalization, resulting in better outcomes for his patients. His clinical interests include minimally invasive brain tumor surgery, skull base and pituitary surgery, neuroendoscopy, microneurosurgery, complex spinal surgery, and peripheral nerve surgery. In his practice, Dr. Lewis employs a thoughtfully conservative approach dedicated to delivering outstanding neurosurgical care with an individual patient-centered focus. Thank you, Dr. Lewis, for your involvement in our webinar program. There will be a brief delay as we change presenters. Dr. Lewis, you should see on your end to accept. Show my screen. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. And I can see your screen. But it's not a webinar presentation. There it is. Okay, I see it. Let's see. Uh, cancel, let's see. Okay, slideshow from start. We Looks good? good. Yep. Looks good. Sound is good. Okay. It's all yours. So welcome, everyone. Uh, excited to have everybody here today. I'm excited to have the opportunity to present to everyone. Um, you know, as patients and healthcare providers, we live in kind of a really exciting time with lots of changes and advances uh, affecting the way we do things, and uh, exceedingly more, uh, increasingly more resources uh, available to us uh, to uh, help uh, affect better patient outcomes. For example, as patients, you know, this website, this group, the Pituitary Network Association, is one of the most powerful tools that uh, you as patients have um, at your disposal because other patients that have gone through the same thing are often able to provide key insights and uh, experiences and, and tips with the way they've dealt with things and the experiences they've had. So reaching out and leaning on each other as you, as you go through the healing process is, uh, is really an amazing tool. Um, in the other other realms, one of the one of the great blessings we've had is uh, amazing advances in, in technology, uh, which are finally being able to make their way into the into the healthcare sphere. So. Um, a bit of a historical perspective, you know, the first transphenoidal surgery for pituitary tumor was performed in 1907, so 110 years ago, uh, and this required a, an external rhinotomy. Basically, they had to essentially cut two-thirds of the nose uh, away from the face uh, and use that as a portal uh, to gain access to the sphenoid sinus. So uh, although we no longer do it this way, um, the, the, you know, because of the disfiguring incision, um, it was an important landmark because it showed us that you know, we could do these operations without uh, going through the skull, without opening the top of the skull, and it could be done through the nasal cavity and through the sphenoid sinus. So that was 110 years ago, that was then. Uh, and this is now. So, you know, this is the quote. I use the quotations, the modern era of neurosurgery. <clears throat> the majority of, uh, of, of neurosurgery, intracranial surgery, <clears throat> is still done through these large and sometimes disfiguring incisions. Although most places now are doing pituitary surgery uh, through the nose, uh, many patients with other 
pituitary region tumors such as craniopharyngiomas and meningiomas still end up with these very disfiguring incisions and large, uh, I call imprecise craniotomies. Um, so one of the things I've been fortunate to be involved in uh, through my training, both at the University of Virginia uh, and uh, with Dr. Dan Kelly uh, at, the, at the John Wayne Cancer Institute, is advancing the science of minimally invasive approaches to pituitary surgery and surgery of the paracellar region, as well as intracranial tumors. So uh, this is kind of pushing the science forward, and I've been blessed to have uh, some amazing mentors, Dr. John Jay Jr. and Dr. Dan Kelly, um, that have really taught me uh, these techniques and, and I'm working on carrying them forward. So we live in a time, as I said, where technical advances are really permeating every aspect of, of neurosurgery and it's it's allowing us to do our job with increasingly precise uh, with increasing precision and accuracy so one of these major advances is intraoperative neuro navigation so the ability to track the tips of the instruments uh, in the operating room and register them to the position of the patient's head so that in real time we can see where we are exactly within the patient's head and in reference to the critical structures, both the tumor itself as well as the critical nerves and vascular structures and the structures of the skull base. Uh, we've been, uh, we have advanced uh, imaging technology, so not the MRIs nowadays not only allow us to see the structures of the brain and the tumor, but also the important fiber tracts, the optic pathways, uh, the visual and auditory pathways, the speech pathways, all of these can be seen now structurally on MRI. We are constantly working to develop refined instrumentation, so uh, you, being able to use increasingly low profile instruments to work through smaller and smaller openings allows us to have more, uh, make more precise and therefore smaller craniotomies. Uh, the uh, use of the Doppler vessel probe, this is a pencil-like device that allows us to listen uh, for the carotid arteries, particularly within the cavernous sinuses, so that even if we can't directly see where the vessels are, we're able to listen and tell where they are, and therefore avoid injury. And then endoscopy, high-definition endoscopy, is one of the fields where we, as neurosurgeons, were kind of slow to, to get to the game, so to speak. Uh, Neuro, general surgeons have been using laparoscopes in the belly for 50 or 60 years or more uh, to do hernia repairs and gallbladder and uh, appendix operations. Uh, but neurosurgeons, we kind of we think pretty highly of ourselves, and so uh, we just kind of you know we're like, well, that's not quite good enough for for neurosurgery. When in reality, uh, when we kind of took a look at the technology for for endoscopes and started applying it, it allowed us really to. Uh, to miniaturize or go through uh, you know, smaller uh, openings uh, in order to do the same operations. And the, to give you an idea, I mean, this picture here using a high-definition endoscope shows the optic chiasm during a pituitary surgery, and these vessels on the surface of the chiasm are less than a tenth of a millimeter in diameter. So uh, the ability to see these and therefore preserve them is afforded by endoscopy just like it would be afforded by, to us by a microscope. The difference is, is that by introducing the source of visualization and light up to the hole, we get the concept of keyhole neurosurgery. So we live in a time where old school keyholes are no longer really something that we have any experience with, but the idea is that with the older style keyholes, if you actually put your eye up to the keyhole, you could see everything that was on the other side uh, because of the small opening. Uh, that all that's necessary is to introduce the visual apparatus, either the eye or in this case the endoscope, up to and potentially even into the opening, uh, and you'd be able to see everything that's on the other side of the door. So this concept, um, which is taught to me by Dr. Jane and Dr. Kelly, is the idea of removing tumors through smaller and more precise openings to minimize all the damage to all tissues, damage to the brain, scalp, uh, muscle, uh, and the nerves, uh, so as to provide the most precise access to the tumor and therefore the best neurological outcome. So the kind of poster child of, um, of, en of endoscopic surgery or keyhole approaches is the endonasal approach because it's basically, it's doing an operation where we don't even make an incision at all. We're able to use the naturally occurring orifices of the nostrils as a portal through which to operate by using this endoscope, which is only four millimeters in diameter, introducing it up into the nostrils uh, and then to the sphenoid sinus, we can see and therefore manipulate and remove tumors uh, and the surrounding structures. So 
it, it isn't though we can't credit entirely modern technology for the idea of accessing the brain uh, through the nose. It was actually the ancient Egyptians. Uh, who first recognized the idea uh, that through the nose you could get to the brain. This is actually part of the process of mummification. How during uh, mummifying a body, the way they removed the brain was to stick a hot pro poker basically through the back of the nose, through the sphenoid sinus into the brain, and then melt the contents of the brain, let them drain out or pull them out through the nose. So the ancient Egyptians do deserve some credit for this. Uh, we have a little, a few techniques which allow us to be a little more refined in our approach, and the patients tend to live afterwards. But um, uh, otherwise, uh, they, they do deserve some uh, uh, credit for for pioneering this technique. So all of those were major advances. Um, the, the use of endoscopy, the use of this refined instrumentation, the use of navigation are all major advances. And then in 2015, uh, another giant leap forward came onto the scene, and that's something called surgical theater. And I call this 22nd century. We're not in the 22nd century, but I really do feel like this is 22nd century precision neurosurgery. Um, so this is another one of those areas where neurosurgeons opened up their eyes and were able to borrow technology from another field of science, in this case from flight simulation and the military. So uh, we look at what do fighter pilots and neurosurgeons have in common. So for fighter, fighter pilots, uh, they have a mission. They, before the mission, they have a briefing. So they come up with a plan. This is what we're going to do. And then for fighter pilots, they actually simulate it. They sit down in a simulator, and they get an idea. They rehearse the, the, the mission in a 3D simulated environment <clears throat> so they can get an idea of where the trouble spots are, where the target is, where the enemies are, and so that when they go to conduct the mission, uh, they will have already been there. So it gives almost this deja vu feeling like, okay, I know where I am. I've been in this spot before. I know how to get out of it. And therefore, I know how to complete the mission. Uh, and uh, when, once they complete the mission, they have a debriefing to review their results. So this combination of you know, planning or briefing, simulation, and then conducting the mission results in the mission being accomplished. For surgeons, it's the same thing. We have a, a, a diagnosis stage where we say, okay, this is the problem. We need to come up with a plan to fix it. However, previously, the plan and rehearse stage for neurosurgeons was literally, you know, sitting over a cup of coffee thinking, well, I remember this from my anatomy, uh, and we're going to be kind of thinking through it, and you're going through it in your mind, but there's no actual ability to rehearse the operation, at least there was not. So this plan and rehearse stage was kind of glossed over or kind of minimized. And then we go into the operation, and our experience and our you know, training uh, leads us through with, with a good outcome most of the time. But imagine if we could have the ability to rehearse these operations and you know, in a virtual reality space, just like the fighter pilots do. So that's what the, the, that surgical theater is. It was a technology developed by two Israeli fighter pilots um, who came up with the idea of, well, we simulate for flight missions, we simulate for battle with the virtual reality. Why can't we simulate brain surgery? Why can't we provide the surgeons with the opportunity to rehearse their operations before actually doing them on the patient, and therefore have a higher opportunity or a, large, a higher likelihood of the patient being cured of their disease? So th this is uh, the technology, and that introduces the world of mediated reality technology into the scene, into neurosurgery. And there's essentially two different types that we're going to talk about of mediated reality technology. The first is virtual reality. So using computer technologies that use software to ge generate realistic images and other sensations that simulate the user's physical presence. So this is virtual reality, like a virtual reality flight simulator, allows us to feel as if we were in the, the in the fighter jet, or in our case, feel as if we were in the surgery to give us the same view we would have during surgery. That is similar, but not entirely the same as augmented reality, where we use the same we, a direct live view of the surgery, meaning as we're performing it, and then the images, the video images, are augmented with those computer generated images to improve our ability to see, hear, smell. This is one example of this in the kind of real world is GPS.
PS data, as we're driving on the road, we are, our actual experience of driving is augmented by live tracking of our position in space. So as we follow the road, we know where we're going. That same concept is used with augmented reality and surgery, so we have the live video, which is overlaid by the, the virtual image, giving us an augmented image of not only what we're seeing, but what we can't see. So it allows us to see the target, even if we can't see it. It allows us to see the optic nerves that we know are there, but it allows us to see precisely where they are, so we can avoid damaging them. So just to give you an idea, many of you may have seen uh, these videos of, uh, of oh, that's not working. Okay, we're going to pull up the video here, the first video. Many of you may have seen previous videos of uh, neurosurgery, uh, of MRIs, where uh, what they look like, or you've seen the, the, the pictures, uh, what they look like is these kind of 2D black and white images. So this is the kind of standard image you would have seen with these three these sections that we have to deal with that are black and white. They provide only 2D, and they don't allow us to really see in and around. The surgical theater creates these 3D models where this is the surgeon. This shows me actually flying in and gives me the surgeon's point of view that I will have when I'm looking at the tumor. So if I want to see what I'm going to actually see, I can see here the position of the carotid artery and the middle cerebral artery and anterior cerebral artery as it's draped over the top of the tumor. I can see the position of the optic nerve here. And I can not only see the position from the surgeon's point of view, I can see it from any other point of view that I want to. So I can spin around the image. I can look from above. I can look from below. I can look from behind. I can actually get up close and see exactly where where is that carotid artery going to be? Is it pushed up to the top? Is it pushed over to the side? Where is the optic nerve? We can get these ideas kind of generally by looking at the 2D images, but this really gives us this kind of 3D, see-through, almost Superman-type vision, so we can see where the important targets are, meaning the tumor. We can see where the important vascular structures are. For example, this is the basilar artery at the back of the tumor, splitting into the posterior cerebral arteries bilaterally. You can see how this gives us a much more comprehensive idea when we're flying through before surgery of what we're going to be able to see and where the trouble spots are so we can stay out of trouble when we get into surgery. So that's just a, a kind of the first example of this. Um, this becomes even more advanced when we uh, – look at all the possible tools that we can use in this virtual environment. So this is, uh, again, a different pituitary case where it's showing us this is the, the view that we're going to have. We remove the soft tissue to allow us to see better. And this is the approach. This is us actually going up through the nose. We're flying up, and I can use my hands in the virtual environment. So now I'm in virtual reality space, and I'm actually able to practice practice this operation, manipulate things with my hands. I can move the tumor around. I can move the structures around. I can reach in and pull myself to a different point of view. This is all in virtual space before the operation is even performed. So it allow, I can measure things. I can measure in any dimension that what, what, what the dimensions of the tumor. I can measure the dimensions of the optic nerve. I can measure the dimensions of the carotid artery just with my hand in space here. And this ability to rehearse and plan and kind of feel like you're there is very similar to those flight simulator technologies where I, if I've done this in advance, if I've rehearsed in virtual space, I go into the operation and I've kind of already been there. It gives me this, you know, feeling of deja vu. So So that once I'm there, uh, I, you know, I'm able to, with, with higher likelihood, perform the operation safely and with more precision and have a higher likelihood of removing the whole tumor. So these technologies, you ask, so, okay, that's great. You're able to see these things, but how do you actually integrate them into your continuum of care? So the benefits of virtual reality and augmented reality in your surgery can be seen across the care continuum. So that... We can use preoperative virtual reality for planning and rehearsal. We're going to talk about a case of that. We can use it for intraoperative navigation. We're going to talk about that. We use it for patient engagement. We're going to show some data of how it helps patients to better understand their conditions, for community outreach, and for education and collaboration. So the first case we're going to show is how to use virtual reality in the planning and rehearsal phase. So 
The case number one is a 39-year-old male who presented with visual loss in the right eye. And this is a tumor, it's not a pituitary tumor, it's a, it's a tuberculum cella or a clinoidal meningioma, which is just above the pituitary gland, but putting pressure in the pituitary stalk as well as the right optic nerve. Based on this preoperative 2D imaging, I had planned what I was going to do was a, we, we made, we built in the 3D model, and I planned what was to be an eyebrow craniotomy, a superorbital craniotomy, which some of you may be familiar with, and I was thinking I was going to be able to get the whole tumor out, but when I went into the virtual reality mode here, when I went into the planning, I was able to see most of the tumor I'd be able to access through this superorbital corridor, but there was a tiny little tongue of tumor that I can see down here, that I can see, this is the superior orbital fissure at the back of the orbit where the nerves which move the eye, cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6, come into the orbit. And so I can't get to that. I can't go down there without damaging those nerves and causing double vision in the patient. So I only realized that that I, but that I was not going to be able to get the whole tumor out after doing the virtual reality rehearsal. So the morning of surgery, I actually changed the plan. I said, okay, we've done this. We tried it and went through one angle. Let's change the approach. Let's go at it through a different way. Let's try a mini terioral craniotomy. So instead of an incision within the eyebrow, we made a small incision behind the patient's hairline. This is all in virtual space and practice the operation. Okay, now this is the view I'm going to have from the side. You can see from this view, I can see both the top portion of the tumor, but as well that bottom portion of the tumor that was hanging down near the cavern sinus and superior orbital fissure. And by mobilizing the middle cerebral artery up and away from the tumor, uh, I was going to be able to access the entire tumor. And so the virtual reality rehearsal allowed me to actually change the approach and avoid performing an incomplete or some might say unsuccessful operation. <clears throat> and instead of making that mistake in the patient, I made the mistake in virtual space, corrected it, and then performed the correct operation on the patient and was able to get a complete tumor removal. This this patient uh, had complete recovery of his vision, and seven days after surgery ran 10 miles. Uh, so it's you know, a real testament to how it's allowing us to do more and more minimally invasive approaches uh, and preserve the function, uh, and in some cases spare us from doing an incomplete operation. So that's virtual reality planning and rehearsal. Um, it's also, the system can also be used for, for intraoperative navigation. This is where we kind of tie in the augmented reality uh, to, to, the, to the realm of neurosurgery. So again, again, augmented reality is using the live view images uh, in conjunction with, uh, with the uh, virtual or computer generated images to give us a heads up display. So the EndoSnap integrates, tracks, and synchronizes the live endoscopic video with the patient-specific virtual reality reconstructions. What this allows is for us to, just like a fighter pilot with the heads-up display of targeting information, altitude, you know, uh, speed, it allows us to have this heads-up the positioning of where the optic nerves are, where the tumor is, even if we can't see those. In this picture here, you can't see where the optic nerves are, but from the augmented heads-up display information afforded by the endosnap, I can see exactly where the optic nerves are and therefore preserve them. So I'm going to show a video of this now. Um, So this is a patient we did last year uh, using the endosnap, a 68-year-old male presenting with visual loss. They have the kind of typical bitemporal hemianopsia. Uh, with this, this is the tumor here kind of stretching up. Uh, pretty standard pituitary tumor with a little bit of a cystic hemorrhagic component stretching the optic nerves up. Again, the standard 2D images are presented first just because that's what many people are used to seeing. But then we included now the augmented reality. So on the left is the live surgical video of what we're actually seeing. And on the right is the virtual reconstruction of the same projected from the same point of view as the camera. So you can see that on the left, the field is kind of filled with blood. We can't really see what the tumor is. We can't really see where the structures are. But on the right with the virtual image, I have this overlay which allows me to see both where the tumor is as well as where the optic nerves are, where the critical vessels are above. And so you can see I'm using the augmented image here on the right to see exactly where that purple tumor ends on the right side and make the incision just in the right place by using this augmented image. Where over here I can't see 
see where the two words are. This is me making an incision in the dura, again, using the augmented image on the, on the right uh, for guidance as to that, exactly where to make those incisions. Then once we've made that, we're able to peel up the dura just like you normally do. We're starting to see the tumor come into play here. As we start to dissect around, we're looking at this kind of smooth capsule of the tumor, and we're able to peel it away. And if we look back and forth between the left side and the right side of the image, and these, these videos are sped up to allow condensation of four hours down into about two minutes so you can see them. But you can see how I'm tracking along the edge of this purple uh, outline of the tumor, and I can see exactly where the tumor is, even when the lines of it may be somewhat blurry within the live surgical video. So I'm using this heads-up display to allow myself to very carefully track in and around the tumor. Here is me peeling it away from the, the pituitary gland above and removing the tumor while preserving this capsule and the pseudo-capsule intersection, which many of you may may be familiar with. Um, the ad added advantage of being able to see where the optic nerves are, even though I can't see them, uh, is really beneficial uh, to improve the safety of these operations. And as I remove the tumor, the virtual image doesn't remove it automatically because it's, it's you know, this is based on the preoperative MRI, but I can then virtually remove as much of the tumor as I've removed the surgery to catch up with where what, what I've accomplished in the operation. So now, look at how accurate this is. This is the cyst within the superior portion of the tumor where that hemorrhage was. And this, this is that same cyst. You can see how accurate the view from the virtual image is with the view that's provided by, by the, the endoscopic camera. They match identically. So I know that I'm inside this cyst and therefore I'm able to safely remove the tumor and with knowing what the position of the optic nerves are, protect them, and therefore protect the patient's vision. So, again, the ability to see, this is the live video. You can't see where the optic nerves are. And as a surgeon, I know approximately where they are, but I, it's really helpful to be able to see exactly where they are based on the navigation, based on this augmented reality view. And I know that it's right because the, the outline of the cyst matches exactly with the position of the cyst as seen on the live video. So this, again, heads-up display truly augments or enhances my ability to perform the operation safely. So, again, we've gone through preoperative planning and rehearsal. We've gone through intraoperative navigation. It's also really useful for patient engagement, and this is one of the areas where we're seeing increasing benefits to the patients because many of you may have had the experience of being in the surgeon's office and you're kind of looking at these 2D images and it's black and white and it doesn't really make a lot of sense if you're not used to looking at them. So you may have kind of left the office like, well, I kind of trust the doctor, but I don't really understand what's going on. Whereas you can see where these 3D reconstructions of the brain, it's pretty obvious to see that this is a brain, this is a skull, there's the nose. Uh, and so you have a better understanding of what's going on and patients feel more educated and therefore more informed and better to able to understand their own condition. Uh, we've been tracking the effects of this on patients at home um, and we found that it has helped dramatically in our, in our the growth of our programs. So in 2014, when we started the program, they were doing, just before I arrived, they were doing about five or six pituitary operations a year. And by implementing virtual reality and engaging patients in the continuum of their own care, we've grown it to approximately 80 to 90 pituitary surgeries per year in just over three years. So I attribute this in part to the benefits of virtual reality in allowing patients to feel more engaged in their own care. And this is, uh, this is shown by the amount of patients that, uh, that stay with us or that you know, ha end up having surgery here. Because since introducing virtual reality consultations into the, into the preoperative planning phase, our conversion rate, meaning the amount of patients to whom we've recommended surgery who stay here and end up having surgery has gone up from 62 to 84 percent. This is a testament to the power of the patient's in engagement process and that if they feel more engaged and more informed, they're more likely to want to come here as opposed to um, seek care elsewhere uh, for, for their pituitary tumors because we're able to give them a more comprehensive understanding of what the problem is. 
So uh, finally, we're going to talk about the benefits of, uh, uh, as far as virtual reality for community outreach. And this is something that's kind of dear to my heart. Uh, when I was in sixth grade, uh, a neurosurgeon came to my, my uh, science class and brought a cadaver brain, and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Uh, and that's why I became a neurosurgeon 25 years later. So uh, a couple of months ago, I had the opportunity to uh, go to speak to a sixth grade science class here during their medical residency week. Uh, and we brought the surgical theater technology with us uh, and what this allowed was uh, for us to uh, give the kids these kids the same opportunity uh, to fly through the brain uh, and really hopefully get some of them engaged uh, in neurosurgery and so to try and plant that seed uh, in some of these kids was really an opportunity for me so this is kind of a little clip from the from the LA Times where uh, we again brought this to the school and allowed the uh, freezing here And I can bring myself down that. I'm inside this page and I can look up and around. And I can see what's on the other side. I can push it back. See there, these very important vessels here. This right here is the carotid artery. So this is draped up over the top of the tumor. This one right here is the basilar artery, which gives the blood supply to the brainstem. And if I look back, I can actually see the whole that I came in. So I've kind of flown all the way around and I'm looking back at it. I'm looking out the hole that I came in the focus so I can fly back out that now if I want to. And now I look turn back around and there it is. If I want to fly back in, I can pull myself into the brain there. So this is pretty cool to me to be able to, you know, in addition to the uh, benefits to the patients, to be able to use this system uh, for community outreach, uh, to be able to educate local kids in science classes and be able to get them really excited and engaged uh, about what we're doing in neurosurgery uh, and hopefully get one of them to want to grow up and be me. So um, I'm really proud to be part of the, the spectrum of, uh, of uh, teaching hospitals uh, and uh, uh, forward-thinking centers that are kind of leading the way in virtual reality assisted neurosurgery. Again, I'm at Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach at Hogue Neurosciences Institute. Uh, and you can see the other, other centers that are part of this team, Stanford, uh, NYU, Barrow, Mayo Clinic, um, you know, Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals. Uh, we're really leading the way in, in virtual reality neurosurgery and introducing this technology uh, in order to make uh, our surgeries more successful and in order to better the lives of our patients. Uh, so. Um, uh, I'm going to talk. I'm going to finish up with a couple, two more cases to kind of demonstrate the capabilities of the system, and then we'll take a couple of questions. The first case is a 71-year-old male uh, presenting with gait ataxia and instability, uh, and the MRI showed a large third ventricle mass with obstructive hydrocephalus. So uh, this is the tumor here. Again, these are the standard 2D images first. Uh, within the third ventricle, uh, and again, this is a pro sagittal view or profile view of the same. Here's the tumor within the third ventricle. Here's the pituitary stalk. Here's the pituitary gland itself. And because the patient had hydrocephalus or blockage of fluid or buildup of fluid within the brain, I chose to use a transventricular approach or use the ventricles as an operating portal. And I combined the surgical theater with another technology. Technology, uh, called the Nico Brain Path, which is basically a um, port which allows us to operate through the ventricles or through the brain uh, and remove the tumor through a port the size of a dime. So it's again using advanced technologies and combining them uh, in order to be able to minimize the trauma to the surrounding brain and blood vessels and perform the operation uh, safely and effectively. So uh, this is, uh, we've got a video showing uh, the combination of these technologies. Uh, let's So this is again, this is now you saw the 2D images, but now we're going to see the 3D fly through of the same. These are the fiducial markers, which sometimes we use to allow for registration of the navigation. This is the 3D fly through. So we can see the brain, we can see the blood vessels, we can see the dilated ventricular system or the hydrocephalus. And we can see the tumor here in green, very clearly highlighted. We can see them very clearly in the position of all the blood vessels of the circle of Willis. We can fade in and fade out the brain or fade in and fade out various structures to see what we want to be able to see to have a closer look. And you can see this ability to have this three-dimensional uh, fly-through and evaluation and close-up look at the exact relationships of where the tumor is in relation to these critical structures 
really gives me a better understanding in this particular patient of the three-dimensional anatomy of their tumor. So again, uh, providing me as much information as possible to be able to remove the tumor safely. We can actually remove the tumor from the picture, to, to, again, to give us this kind of see-through vision of what's on the other side of it. So what am I going to see once I remove the tumor? What, you know, where are the vessels going to be? I won't be able to see them directly at surgery, but I will be able to see them with the virtual reality and augmented reality technology uh, so that I can uh, know where they are and avoid them, uh, avoid injuring them. Because injuring these critical vessels, the carotid arteries, the basilar artery, would be catastrophic for the patient. So the ability to see them before surgery uh, and during surgery and know exactly where they are allows me the ability to increase chance of being able to protect them. Um, and so uh, this is, again, being able to see it from the top, from the side, from all the angles uh, is, is something that's never been before been possible. But it gives us, again, that like flight simulation. And now this is the same thing. This is the intraoperative navigation, navigating down the brain path using the endosnap. So again, the live video on the left and the augmented reality video on the right are the heads up display showing me exactly where the tumor is as I fly down the brain path port down into the the, the ventricle, and this is now looking through down into the third ventricle. This is the tumor at the opening of the third ventricle. This is the fornix here. Again, we're going to take another fly through so we can see exactly. Look at how accurate the tracking of the position of the, the camera and the augmented reality version of the same uh, is on the right side video. So even if I weren't able to see this tumor, for example, this were filled with blood, I'd be able to see it on the virtual image and know how far I could go without damaging anything. This bird's eye view in the lower right here kind of shows me where I am in relation to the brain. And now this is after having removed the tumor, I'm flying again in with the through the port and I'm looking, I've done a septum pellucidotomy or fenestration of the, of the wall between the ventricles and now I'm looking down the frame of the row and the tumor has now now been removed with the fornix still intact uh, and now I'm looking at the tumor having been removed and again it's been removed on the virtual side is the same so I can see what's on the other side of it. So this ability to navigate to use this tool of the brain path and to be able to reconstruct a virtual model to see both from the side and from this and from the bird eye view of what I'm going to be doing during surgery increases the success rate and increases the likelihood that I'm going to be able to, to do the operation safely and effectively and get the patient the outcome that they're all hoping for. So that was a ca case we actually did just last week, and it turned out the timing of it was great um, to be able to showcase all, the, the, all those technologies together and be able to, to, to show them to you to show kind of what kind of stuff we're doing. Um, the last case here is a 48-year-old female uh, who presented with six months of progressive visual loss. Uh, and this is loss of peripheral vision, but also worse on the left than on the right. Uh, again, she presented with a... Uh, a, a, a Planum sphenoidale meningioma with significant displacement. So this is the pituitary gland below, displacement of the optic system above, displacement of the anterior cerebral arteries up. Uh, for her, we planned a superorbital or eyebrow craniotomy with a small incision within the eyebrow. Um, this is the kind of uh, incision we plan out. With the, this is the incision within the eyebrow. Uh, and we're going to show the final virtual video of the same here um, with these images. Uh, including both the pre-operative and the post-operative images. So again, just at the beginning, the 2D uh, black and white ICOM images are shown. Uh, this is the tumor here originating just above the pituitary, uh, displacing the pituitary stalk posteriorly, displacing the optic chiasm way up and causing visual loss. So these images give us a certain amount of information, but look at the degree the increased degree of visualization we get with these 3D images. I mean, really getting a much better idea of the position of the tumor, of the position of the vessels, the green structures of the optic nerves, which have been significantly displaced in this case. And the tumor, in this case, meningiomas are very vascular, so it appears somewhat red in the center with this kind of bluish hue on the outside uh, to, to delineate tumor versus blood vessels. So you can see how the optic chiasm and the optic nerves have been displaced posteriorly by this tumor, and it's sitting right in the space between the optic nerves, really compressing this optic chiasm posteriorly. I can see the anterior cerebral arteries are displaced up. This is the anterior communicating artery. And so the ability to have this, again, three-dimensional spatial awareness uh, in this particular 
specific to this individual patient is something that's been never before afforded to us in surgery and the technology from surgical theater makes this possible. The, again, seeing exact position of the optic nerve as it's displaced and bent over to the side here um, and, and compressed by the tumor allows me to know exactly where it's going to be at the time of surgery. And then what I can do is I can actually plan in the craniotomy. So I build in the surgical trajectory. And I can show this to the patient beforehand. Okay, this is your head. Here's your nose. Here's your skull. This is what we're going to do. This is the plan. We're going to go in. We're going to make this hole above your eyebrow. We're going to fly in. And this is the view I'm going to have. It's surgery. I can fly right up to the tumor. I can actually fly to, through the tumor. I can see where the optic nerves and chiasm are and therefore will be able to protect them at the time of surgery. I'm actually looking now from back out through the, op, through the hole we came in. This is a view I wouldn't even be able to get at surgery. So again, it's augmenting my ability because it's giving the three-dimensional kind of, again, Superman vision to see in and around the structures. And now, it allows us to do post-operative evaluation as well. So this is the debriefing. This is that same patient. But now the tumor has been completely removed. And complete removal of this tumor of this patient uh, is it's a difficult operation. Uh, it's, it requires very careful dissection of the tumor away from the vascular structures, away from the pituitary stalk, away from the optic nerves and chiasm. And so it's critical to know where those structures are in order to preserve them. Uh, this patient uh, also did very well. This is a patient I did about a month ago. Uh, her vision improved from 2200 in the left eye uh, pre-op to 2030 uh, within 48 hours of surgery post-op. Uh, and it, it, again, the, the 3D reconstruction here is showing the complete uh, tumor removal, uh, which is afforded by the combination of surgical techniques as well as the, the technology uh, making the operation safer. Uh, this is that same patient. Uh, so this, uh, again, shows the cosmetic effects uh, with the eyebrow incision. You can just barely, she's, she's got a little bit less hair on this eyebrow as compared to the other side, but the incision the scar uh, at only a month out is very difficult to to make out. Uh, this is these are again pre-op the DICOM images on the top and post-op images on the bottom showing gross total removal. And I just wanted to finish off by uh, kind of touching on what all this means. So all this technology is great. Uh, it's nice to be able to have the tools. It's nice to be able to see these beautiful images and reconstructions. But in reality, what matters most to us is the ability to improve patients' lives. The first patient I showed you happened to be an artist, and as I mentioned, he was going blind from the tumor, and uh, he was losing his sight, so he came to me, and through that operation uh, and the technology helping the operation, we were able to restore his vision, uh, and he painted me this painting, which is a, a picture of a bison uh, on Catalina Island, uh, which is near where I live, uh, and uh, these little tiny blades of grass are reminders to me every day of uh, that in this one patient, I was able to restore his sight to him, uh, and that there is no better use of technology uh, in the world today than the ability to restore function, to be able to improve patients' lives. Uh, and that's what gets us, that's what gets me excited about doing what I do, that's what gets me out of bed every day. And so this painting, which is a big, you know, three by four canvas sitting on my wall in my office, is a reminder to me every day that uh, the reason we do what we do uh, is to make patients' lives better. And so uh, I'll end on that note. Thank you for your attention, and I, I can take any questions that you may have at this time. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, first question, are there... 3D color imaging MRI testing available that can be done as opposed to a normal MRI to diagnose a pituitary tumor? If so, where would a patient be able to get this test done? So the MRIs that we use to, uh, to construct the 3D images are actually the same MRIs which would, you would normally get in planning for in, in diagnosis of surgery. So they are what's, what's called a stealth MRI or, or navigation protocol MRI. It's just a traditional MRI with thin cuts. So it's not the, it's not the MRI which affords the 3D color reconstruction. It's the technology uh, that is afforded by doing the post-processing or taking those MRIs and then putting them into the surgical theater system, which generates these three-dimensional images. And there's about, uh, I think, 12 or 13 centers now uh, which, uh, which allow these 3D reconstructions. Hogue is one of them. UCLA is uh, another one in California, as well as Stanford. Um, I know NYU, Cleveland Clinic, uh, Florida Hospital, Barrow, um, Mayo Clinic, uh, North Shore uh, in Chicago. Um, 
Those are the ones that I can think of off the top of my head, again, that are offering these 3D reconstructions and including the preoperative or, or, or diagnosis and planning phase, uh, which you can see the patients are able to see their images in 3D space uh, in the office before surgery. Okay, thank you. Um, does this type of technology uh, make it more likely to remove an entire tumor that is uh, previously been inoperable because of being wrapped around a carotid artery or too close to an optic chiasm? Does it help with that type of tumor? It may, um, so depending on the individual case. So a lot of the times it allows us to get a more comprehensive view of what's going on uh, and really get a, a better idea of the three-dimensional anatomy there and it will allow us to better assess whether that's possible physically uh, in some patients it may allow us to proceed to surgery and others it may we may say no that you know that this is indeed surgically you know unresectable and there are certain cases where for example if the tumor is within the cavernous sinus lateral to the carotid artery or encasing the carotid artery it no matter what the technology is the surgery to go into that space is still not safe so in some cases, it enhances our ability to make the decision as to whether that's possible or not. In other cases, it makes the operation to do those things safer. But in some cases, it, a surgically unresectable tumor may still be deemed surgically unresectable. Okay, thank you. I don't see any more questions. Does anybody else have questions? Such an excellent presentation with so much information. Excellent. Yeah. I'm glad to be here today. Um, you, know, I'm, I, you can access me through my website. If anybody has any further questions or email me, I'm happy to answer them in the future. Okay. Awesome. Uh, you can also contact PNA through our website, pituitary.org. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lewis. This was amazing, fascinating presentation. Um, this concludes today's webinar presentation. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. If we did not get a chance to answer your questions, we'll be answering them by email. If you missed any part of this webinar or if you would like to share it with family and friends, uh, it will be available on our website after it's edited. It should be available either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Uh, there will be a brief survey after the webinar. Please fill it out to help us provide you with the information you need. Uh, again, our website address is pituitary.org. And uh, thank you for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you again, Dr. Lewis. Thank you.